to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Tonight is the, uh, the final speaker of our program, and I just want to say right now, I think all of the speakers have been uh, exactly uh, what we need to hear, the, the, the things they've talked about, the expertise, the uh, support they provided, it's all been just dead on and perfect. And as far as the students are concerned, I, I could not be more pleased. It seems like you guys own this. There's complete ownership by the students. You're talking to each other. You're making your own plans. <clears throat> and uh, this thing is going to have a life of its own. And I, I just couldn't be more pleased. But these speakers have played a critical role telling us the kinds of things that are possible, things that are needed, providing you know, information on how, how can you act, what can you do realistically. And, and Iran is just <clears throat> is the last of a series of, of stellar speakers. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Ron. He's one of my favorite people. I never told him this, but first of all, he's from Montana. And my family has, goes back uh, five generations there. So that's already a plus. There are not too many of us. Um, he, uh, <clears throat> he got his bachelor's and master's degrees in entomology, working with bee physiology, which it tells you exactly why you can't predict your future. He, uh, B physiology at UC Davis, very prominent research school, and then went off to the Peace Corps in Malaysia. <clears throat> and um, he didn't just come home when it was done, he just told me he hitchhiked home. It took him 18 months to reach Italy, and I suppose you gave up and bought a ticket at that point. I ran out of money. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he knows how to ask for the bathroom and order beer in at least 15 languages, he tells me. But he came back and got a PhD <clears throat> In ecology, and for his PhD research, he worked on a small island off of Sumatra yes. on a, an endemic gibbon. And every day he had to pass through the territory of one of two tribes. I guess this island was two tribes control the island, and they had to pick one. He picked this one, and he has a tattoo, maybe he'll show it to you on his arm, of a, t of a gibbon from that tribe that made him a member, I guess, made it safe to traverse the. And this, you guys think ecology is rough now, but it was, <clears throat> it was a different thing. After, he, after that, he got his, you know, he got his PhD, then he, he worked in uh, Namibia for four years. And his wife, Janet, bless her heart, went with him and uh, still supporting him in all of this. And he came back <clears throat> and started a, a career at the Minnesota Zoo starting in 1982 and um, has been a leader both at that zoo and nationally in all sorts of conservation, especially in, well, I don't know if that's true, but certainly in tiger conservation. And he's been, <clears throat> I don't know if I get these titles proper, correct, but he's, you know, he's basically written the manual on how do you manage tigers in captivity. He chaired the Tiger Species Survival Plan of the AZA for many years, and um, <clears throat> was a founding member of the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group of the IUCN which is a group that's targeted on endangered species, originally in captivity, but now captivity and wild. Um, and it brings all sorts of experts together, and they deal with issues such as you know, pandas, or freshwater dolphins, or tigers, or grizzly bears, individual species at high risk, where they bring workshops together of people like this, and they, at the end of these discussions, they come up with a plan. And literally, this was modeled after a CBSG working group session. He spent uh, 12 years in the field working with tigers, extensive periods in the field. He basically funded an entire national park in Indonesia for many years, for 12 years, from 250 to $400,000 a year, buying fuel, buying, I suppose, guns, paying salaries, <clears throat> paying the expenses while they did research, and he became a very passionate defender of tigers while he was there. He other, also studied tigers all over South Asia. When we met him, I actually met him through uh, some zoo committees, and when the tigers, tri tigers for Tigers was really getting organized, we wanted to have a speaker, and Ron was the first person we brought. I said, I know a guy, and uh, we brought him to campus, <clears throat> and he gave public lectures, and he came to classrooms, and, and so on. And um, Later that year, one of the things we asked him was, Ron, you've been all over Asia looking at tigers. Where can we go to see tigers in the wild? And he said, I've spent my whole life studying tigers. I've never seen one in the wild. I've trapped hundreds of them for research purposes in the jungles of Southeast Asia. But you know, you can't just walk up on a tiger in the wild. Um, they'll stay away from you. And uh, 
And that later that year, he went to India to receive the Kailash Sankala Prize or award for his work on tiger conservation. And I guess Anjana met him then and Pradeep Sankala, and they took him down to the parks in central India. And he, when he got back, he was very excited, and he emailed me a picture of himself sitting on an elephant. It was a little one, a little a sporty model, two-seater. Yeah. Um, and he was about this high off the ground. And then another picture is there's a tiger here, and there's Ron and Pradeep and a mahout on an elephant. There's his tiger. He said, Dave, I know where you can see tigers. And the next year, then, Pradeep Sankala was our honored guest. And he said, well, you have to come to India to, to see our tigers. And we said, sure. And the rest is history. Um, so I have to thank Ron for that. Um, the students were very impressed with him. Um, at one point, he was challenged, now, how can you accept money from ExxonMobil? You know, it's this huge multinational conglomerate. You know, they throw pennies to tigers, considering the size of the company and all. Isn't that, you know, greenwashing or something? And, and Ron is actually quoted in a book as responding, I'd kiss the devil's ass if it would help save tigers. And that's, you know, that's his attitude. He will do what it takes. And, and you know, we've got some passionate defenders of tigers here. And um, <clears throat> anyway, he's won all sorts of prizes, and he's published 300 popular and scientific articles. I should mention he co-edited Tigers of the World, The Biology, Biopolitics, Management, and Conservation of an Endangered Species in 87. Um, <clears throat> The Management and Conservation of Captive Tigers in 94, which is now translated into the national languages of Thailand, Indonesia, Russia, China, and Vietnam. And in 2010, Tigers of the World, the Biology, Politics, and Conservation of Panthera Tigers, second edition. Ron is a real expert, and he knows the politics, but he knows the biology and the conservation of tigers, and also the captive, the, the captive population. So it's, it's a great pleasure for me to have him here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I hope that comment didn't annoy anyone. Uh, I got in a lot of trouble for it, to be quite honest, but nevertheless, it was true. Um, I also remember when I came here, uh, the, the, the interaction that I had with the students, and, and I remembered that this was something that if it really could happen, it would be quite wonderful. And then um, I sort of lost uh, contact with what was going on here and David uh, uh, and actually Sean first wrote me and then David followed up a follow-up letter and said this is something I think we're going to resurrect and really get going in a real um, uh, a serious uh, fashion and so it, it gives me pleasure to be part of this maybe birth of, of uh, uh, the resurgence of, of uh, Tigers for Tigers. I really wish you all well and um, is what I'm going to try and do is just simply give you a little bit of um, knowledge about uh, what it's like to be around tigers if you have that as a professional career. Let's see if I get this right. That. How about on the top? No. How about if go? Okay. How do you? I'm always befuddled with these things. This, maybe over here. Hmm. hmm. It always happens. It's one of those mm moments. I think it was a little USB thing here. Ah, the little USB-A thing. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <clears throat> I can do it that okay, way. Okay, great. Oh, Old-fashioned way. That's a real field biologist for yeah. you. I think Mark's now fun to Okay. Um, I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of slides of different tigers at different times. This is a Sumatran tiger. And, of course, uh, everyone's always asked me what exactly is a, a tiger. And it's certainly, without a doubt, the largest cat in the world. Uh, they live only in Asia. A lot of people think they come uh, from Africa. And there are about 4,000 of them left. So that's all you need to know about tigers, because that's it. 
And so we have these, these extinct tigers uh, that at one time uh, were found in, in Southeast Asia and, and Central Asia. And most of them are here with the, uh, come through, and you can see we have uh, the Caspian tiger disappeared somewhere in the 50s and 70s. And I'm gonna come back to the Caspian tiger because it holds the future for what, the, the, what tiger restoration in the Asian landscape is all about. <clears throat> There's also the, the Bali tiger that disappeared, uh, and then the Javan tiger. In fact, I, before I even got into tiger conservation, I was working on Javan tigers in Ujung Kulung National Park is where they disappeared. And I was intrigued with what happened and how did it come to be that there were tigers in this park and now there are none. And so the only place that was really left uh, for tigers anywhere where I could be around was Sumatra, which is this next island up. Uh, from uh, Java and I went and spent 12 years there in the field and I'll show you what that's like when I get to it. There's also the uh, Bengal tiger that uh, Anjan here has, has, has told you all about um, and it is without a doubt um, a, a tiger subspecies that has a, a huge history behind it. Uh, Indian politics, Indian conservation movement, it all really started in India in so many different ways. Uh, and then finally we have, um, ooh, yeah, the Amur tiger. And this Amur tiger and its connection with the Caspian tiger, you're really going to be surprised what that's all about. Uh, I was one of the first field biologists that used the uh, uh, remote cameras that used infrared beams. And I'm sure most of you know what they are. If not, these are cameras that were designed with an infrared beam that you would attach to a tree, have the beam go across the trail where you knew pretty much the tigers were coming up and down, and then these cameras would automatically take a picture, and they could, you could have the date put down, you could have the time put down, and you could also um, then have it, it, it would flash if it was that in, in the dark hours, so you could get a, a picture of these animals. And um, as part of this is that uh, unlike tigers in India that um, have a, a different strategy for catching their prey, tigers that live in, in lowland tropical rainforest and tropical rainforest, these are very, very dense uh, vegetation zones. And like in Waigambas, the, 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 the highest level in this whole park was seven feet above sea level. Half of this place is all underwater continuously. <clears throat> and as what you have is this tiger walking down the trail. You notice there to the right, the tiger is sitting. And this is how the tigers in, in Sumatra and other places actually do their hunting. They, they just simply go and step off the trail by two or three feet. And they wait until the prey comes by and they jump out and say, boo. Um, and it, it's uh, quite unnerving to know that you're in the territory of all of these tigers because you can, you, can, you can smell their urine because they pee everywhere. They, they, you can smell their, their, their feces. You see their, their, their marks, uh, uh, their, their, hoof, their, their, their foot, footprints. But more importantly, when you're really close to them, you hear this really low growl. And that really gets your attention when you hear that. Uh, so how many tigers in the wild remain? Uh, in, in many ways, this is um, uh, fantasy uh, because no one knows how many tigers are in the wild. So there are best guesses. And uh, uh, again, uh, Anjan went through this. Uh, there used to be a time when they uh, used pauperance as a device of estimating how many tigers there were that they used in India. And that came under dispute, and it was pretty much shown scientifically that this was a bogus methodology. Whereas this uh, camera trap system is so much more um, uh, accurate, and I'll show you how that works in a bit. But we do know that as many as a, oh, 100,000 tigers were probably living in Asia uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And in 1998, Peter Jackson of the IU Sins Cat Specialist Group estimated this five to 7,500. And I don't really know where he got that number, but that's what it was. Um, and then here we have this estimate that came out of uh, 
India in 2002, and then in 2007, you could see it's dropping. And the most recent published peer-reviewed uh, estimate is about 4,000, anywhere between 38 and 5,100, that John Seidensticker and a number of his colleagues put together. <clears throat> okay, but here's, here now we're getting into the real issues about tiger um, uh, conservation and the future of tigers. In 2005, the tigers occupied only 7% of their historical range, and, and this was 2005, and they've since lost another almost uh, a couple more percent. So this represents a 93% collapse in the habitat for tigers across all of Asia. And the reason why they can do this is that it's um, pretty easy to have historical records, uh, topography records of what the land mass and what the land cover was. And now they, with the new satellite imagery, they can really uh, accurately measure uh, the decrease in, in habitat. And so uh, in recent years, um, a number of the organizations um, like World Wildlife Fund and uh, uh, Wildlife Conservation, uh, I um, don't particularly agree with what they're doing, but they came up with this um, vision that they wanted to have source sites. In other words, they wanted to have air, the big sites where there are lots of breeding females to concentrate our, our few efforts and our, and our few funds for preserving tigers in the future. Um, my particular uh, take on this is that um, there are so few tigers and so few tiger habitats and every place you go, and I'll talk a little bit about this, there are, there are different threats to the habitat. Sometimes it's logging, sometimes it's mining, sometimes it's, it's overrun by just um, people. Indonesia, it's oil palm plantations uh, uh, up in uh, the Russian Far East, it's timbering. Um, so. You just don't want to concentrate on large areas. You want to try and preserve everything that's there. And the other way I put this is that um, imagine if you um, started out um, with $100,000 with a financial advisor as part of your 401k. In over 25 years, this financial advisor lost 94%, 93% of your and he comes up to you after 25 years and says, geez, I'd like to have another 25-year contract with you to manage your money. Would you hire the son of a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? These are the very same guys that on their watch lost 96% of the habitat and 95% of the living tigers on Earth in Asia, and they're still in power. And so I think it's time for a change. There's a historical map, uh, and this is really kind of fun, because uh, it kind of shows, most importantly, where the tigers that came uh, out of up there with B and D, because what they could never figure out about the Caspian tiger is where did the Caspian tiger come from, which is way up there, and it's on the edge of Iran, uh, Tajikistan, and all of the other uh, stand countries. And it went extinct very early because there weren't very many of them, because mostly they lived in the river valleys with, um, in reeds where the deer lived, and those were cleared uh, by the people that lived there, and pretty much the whole habitat was just simply destroyed, and all of the tigers were lost. So a very, very clever molecular biologist, uh, Carlos Drisco, went and followed the silk route through these areas, and all of those little spots where you see the maps or the little green dots, he went into the museums and collected samples. <coughs> and from the hair, he extracted the molecular DNA, because only in the last, oh, something like uh, the last 10 years, the, the methodology has been developed in the last five years, it's become very sophisticated. And he made a most astonishing discovery astonishing. If you look at the real, the real origin of the Caspian tiger is the tigers that came from B, they came from the Amur tiger population and crossed over through the rivers and followed the riverbeds down through all the way over to where you, where you see BIR. Then these tigers had a second migration back to the Russian Far East and populated that population. The Caspian tiger and the Amur tiger are molecular, identical individuals. They're one and the same. 
So they're thinking, seeing how all of those are gone, and seeing how we have lots of them who are tigers, why don't we think about restoration? And that's what is happening now. And it's kind of an exciting thought, because when everyone talks about uh, the future of tiger conservation, we keep looking at our diminishing number of live tigers. And we can't keep protecting the habitats because it keeps disappearing under the watch of these idiots that are now in charge. So what do we do? Well, we now have a new option, and that is simply the restoration. And so when we look at, that was the wild tigers, and now we, let's just, let me mention a little bit about the world's tigers considering captive tigers too. And we know in zoos we have these managed tigers and unmanaged. Managed means these are the tigers that are in the tiger SSP, um, which is a species survival plan. And uh, at, the, at the root of all of that is that any tiger that is in this uh, essentially managed plan, we can trace its lineages for up to 10 generations, all the way back to its wild-caught mother and father, and we know exactly where it came from. And every one of the births that were, that were made were all registered and all confirmed. And so we have this something like um, uh, 30 some years of, of knowledge of where these tigers came from. And so we know what, their, what their, their genetics are. But then we have in private circles this whole mishmash of, of, of what we call private tigers. And there's, there's approximately 10 to 11,000 and we know that we haven't counted them all because they're, they're all through uh, the United States. <clears throat> and so we have a total cop captive population of 13,000, another total of somewhere around four and a half. So something like 17,000 tigers. And of course, a good number uh, about of that private number, 5,000 are in the United States and another 5,000 are currently living in the Chinese sweatshops of, um, that they have in northern uh, China. And the Chinese have this idea that they're going to breed up to 20,000 tigers as ti in, on tiger farms, and they're going to use their products in uh, traditional Asian medicine, and I will get to that. And then uh, we move to the next issue is, how did some of all of this happen? And of course, conflict uh, with tigers, tiger-human conflict has a huge uh, impact one of the things we did, uh, we went through the uh, uh, databases going all the way back to the 1800s, and I believe have, I have some knowledge there. We actually have data going all the way back to two and a half thousand years in China. For some reason, the Chinese documented every single bite and every single killing by tigers in China over an incredibly long period of time. And it was in archives, and a guy named uh, Coggins actually went to China and got a couple of professors to help him translate all of this and extract that data. And so you have all of these, these crazy wild pictures of these guys, you know, hanging around the gangs that killed this tiger and, and then the, the British Raj and, and all of their uh, tiger hunts. And, and it wasn't just the British, the, the, uh, there's a lot of people who, uh, the, the the wealthy Indians <laughs> were also, the, the royal families were involved. I'm gonna just move on. And what happens when uh, all of this happens with, uh, you have tigers uh, killing people or killing livestock or just terrorizing villages and eating their dogs, is what happens is two things. They either get shot killed or uh, you capture them and uh, bring them into some zoo. And this is a particular male uh, Sumatran tiger that we actually captured. Uh, in um, southern uh, Sumatra that had killed and eaten three different people. Two men, one woman. It was a man-woman eater. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things I, I distinctly recall because we were brought in uh, to help kind of um, process this because we, we found, they called us in and we went hunting and we found the bodies. And it's a pretty gruesome sight to see what a tiger will do to human bodies. So we, we packaged them up in plastic and brought them out. 
And then we set up the traps. And people always say, well, how do you trap a tiger? And the Indonesians are slick. They build just a simple, really strong wooden cage uh, with a simple trap door, like a box with a sliding door, and with a, li a lever that goes back. And they kick, take a goat, a little small goat, and they cut its ears off and spread the blood around and throw the ears outside. And the little goat goes, meh, meh, all night long. And the tiger comes, smells the ears, yum, yum, eats those, walks in, you got him. Door goes down. So now you have a caught tiger. And there was some smart ass reporter who um, said, how do you know that's the tiger that killed the uh, uh, the people, and I knew it was because, and something's going on here. If I just go, anyway, uh, one, we had a picture of this guy just before he was caught. And second, I pointed out, if you look in the corner of the, page, of the cage, you see where he's just pooped his, do you notice what's in there? It was the white underwear of the man he just ate. I know, it's gross, isn't it? <laughs> but that's what field biology is all about. <laughs> so another thing that I was really interested in is because uh, this whole concept of, uh, of people that were going in and, and, and poaching and killing tigers and, all, and everyone always says, you know, and they're shipping them off to China because the Chinese want them for this and this and that. Well, I was really curious, with, was this true? And so we actually hired... Um, uh, uh, an Indonesian who was part of an elite uh, 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 military intelligence force and we uh, hired our own um, essentially uh, information officers of another name, the best name, they're snitches. We hired snitches to go through all of the places that lived in the villages and they would call whenever any of these, uh, anyone from outside was coming in and entering the, the edge of the national park. And, and poachers in Indonesia are just like what happens in India. Th th this isn't the farmer saying, oh, geez, I don't want to go fishing today. I think I'll go, I think I'll go poach a tiger. Um, because they're, most Indonesians are terrified of the forest, and they're terrified of being overnight in the forest. But there are certain clans of people who specialize over multi-generations in catching tigers. And so what we did is we would have snitches around the villages and when these guys would come in they had cell phones and they would call our field rangers who had GPS units and who knew all of the trails and could be at the front of that trail within about eight hours even walking overnight and we would apprehend them as, as soon as they were within four hours inside the park and initially what we did in the early years our general uh, and this wasn't me I didn't make this up my team decided this is how they wanted to deal with it, uh, is what they did is they, they took everything these guys had, including their clothes, all of their equipment, and burnt it. And then they beat the snot out of them, and then they made them crawl out on their hands and knees and whipped them the whole way. And everyone says, oh man, that's rude. <laughs> But you know what? You want a performance indicator? They never came back. We never caught the same poacher twice. <laughs> I know. I'm not supposed to do things like that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and this is, um, uh, in this study is what it was most remarkable, is that um, then these guys not only w would we catch the, many of the poachers, but they were, they were working in, in national parks that weren't e even exactly in our area. So we had our guys go in and pose as undercover agents and they were buying stuff from, uh, and, and what we found out is, is the, Indo the young Indonesian guys, the, you know, the teenagers and young hardworking guys, the loggers and truck drivers, they like to have little amulets of, of whiskers or, or a little piece of tiger skin and they'd wear it around their neck because it allowed them to assume the personality of a tiger. Well, you know that phrase, tiger in a bed? That's what they thought they had. And that's, they bought it. And guess what? Young Indonesian males bought more of these parts 
than any other source. It was the Indonesian youth that were killing their own tigers so that they would be a stud that night. Oh, okay, let's talk a little bit about tiger species survival plan. It was, it was actually developed by this guy, the most wonderful fellow, Ulysses Samuel Seal, um, probably one of the most brilliant people I ever met. Um, he was an endocrinologist, and he was the man that developed um, the techniques for immobilizing tigers, the drugs that you use for immobilizing all of the wild animals, because he was just really interesting. He slept four hours a night. You never had a hotel room with him if you went to a conference because he'd get up at one in the morning after going to bed at nine and he would start typing on this typewriter and then he would start asking you questions. Hey Ron, well, when, when, we, when, when we were in Bangkok doing that? You know, and, and you'd never sleep when you're on this guy. He came up with this great idea of creating this scientific and collaborative and coordinated approach to the management of endangered species and this was in 1980-1981. And it, essentially, it's just essentially maintaining this genetic diverse tiger populations as a genetic insurance policy. It's just real simple. You get together every year and you know how many tigers you have in all of your different zoos. And what you want to do is just simply look at the genetics of each and every individual of, of the breeding males and the breeding females. You don't breed the really young ones and you don't breed the really old ones, but you do the middle-aged ones. And you match up the most distantly related males and females. So I would transfer about 40 tigers every year between the, the 210 zoos that cooperated in this and it would bring together these new mates and then they would breed and have their young. And we kept um, this uh, going, uh, I took over five years later so it was 27 years that I ran this program. And one of the things, again a performance indicator, is that just about seven years ago they developed uh, molecular technique that could extract DNA from feces. And this was a real find because what we could do is we collaborated with the Siberian Tiger Project run by Dale Miguel in the Russian Far East and he collected feces from wild living Amur tigers and we brought it to the United States and we compared it with Amur tigers that were not out uh, were, were completely separate from this living population and they compared it and the genetic diversity between the captive moor tigers in North American zoos is greater than that found in the Russian Far East with the wild tigers. Quite as significantly so, something like 96 to uh, 88 percent. And of course there's all of these other things but that is sort of, it's a blueprint for managing tigers so that, and, and I always said that I don't really particularly think that zoos have a real niche in conservation until they start getting involved with wild populations and supporting wild research and supporting conservation efforts, supporting protection efforts, or even most importantly, and this is where my vision was for the future, I really envisioned using genetics of zoo caught animals to augment wild populations when they started reaching critical low levels. And so we have the master plans and the stud book. These were kept by a lady who worked for me uh, for a number of years and still does. And um, since 1982, um, this is kind of a nice fact there, uh, I, I was essentially the guy who managed, I didn't manage because the zoos really did it all, I just sort of was the head of the committee, uh, 419 uh, young tigers were born in this population more than in the wild. Uh, that lives in the Russian Far East right now. So I felt good about that and so here's a mother with her tigers and now here's the other side of the coin. This is what China has put up. It reminds anyone who has any real knowledge of uh, World War II, uh, the Nazi extermination camps at Dachau and Buchenwald. It's exactly the same. They take these tigers, um, they, uh, they throw the female in when she comes into estrus uh, with a number of males and then she delivers cubs. They take the cubs away from her immediately and stick them on sows. And the sows, the pigs, nourish the tiger cubs. And as soon as you take the cubs away from a mother, 
her oxytocin stops, and so she will come, she will stop uh, uh, production of milk, and within 30 days, she comes back into estrus. So they'll breed this female three times a year. It's against nature. It is not natural. Uh, and then those cubs are taken and put in with sows, and their goal is to get 20, they're up to about 12,000 tigers now in these camps, and they're going to 20,000. And everyone is really quite upset about it, and I can understand why. And I'm, um, I really have a lot of respect and admiration for the Chinese, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, but that part really annoys me. Okay. Now I'm just kind of jumping back to the field because all of this was a progression. Um, I started this in 1995 is when ExxonMobil decided to start up the Save the Tiger Fund and I was one of the recipients of, um, they vetted me and decided that I was going to receive a lot of money and I did, but I didn't have to kiss the devil part. <laughs> <laughs> 12-year study, and, and I, if you just look at that photo, uh, you can see how wet and sloggy it is. Uh, it, it was pretty, uh, I had to get used to this because uh, this is right on the equator. It's about 92 degrees every day and it drops down to about 88 at night. And it's 92% humidity and you're walking in water practically all day long. And we had these cameras, which I'll show you, stretched out over 100 and uh, uh, 26 kilometers, and it would take us three days and two overnights to change the batteries and change the film. And um, during that period of time, uh, and all of the other surveys, is what happens, two things, is one, um, all of the skin from your knee down sloughs off like a snake changing its skin. Um, and two, um, all of the little, ugly little, um, Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking something worse. The little leeches, the little leeches, burrow through the 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 where your boot uh, shoe strings are, and go through your socks, and they start on your ankles, and then they start moving up your leg. And you had to after, you know, after you take your foot off, uh, you'll have a cup of blood that will pour out because when the leech drops off after sucking you for three or four hours of when it's full, it still has uh, injected enough uh, anticoagulant into the wound, so it continues to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed, and so you lose all of this blood. Uh, but it really gets worse is when they get up into your underwear. <laughs> now we're talking, now we're talking important stuff. <laughs> and I used to really hate that. Um, <laughs> But it was part of the it was part of the life, and so there I was on the fifth largest island. And by the way, David, um, the four Mentawi Islands are these four right here, okay. and I was on this island right here. Okay. And then there's these three down here, and this is the big island, Stone Island, Neolithic Island, Neos. That's where I did my four-year period of study. And here we have uh, think of California. If you put California up against this, it's exactly the same, except California has mountains on the west, or on the east, and this has it on the west. It's the same shape, same length, but there's 45 million people living on this island. And 80% um, of them are under 21 years old. So it's gonna really have a real problem. There's seven national parks, and um, here's where we were doing our work. This is uh, the study of the lowland rainforest where I was working, and this is the park here. And we had an area that was about here. This is about 40 miles by 30 miles, okay? 100, 130,000 hectares. And then we had our GIS maps that showed where the vegetation was. These were all villagers right here, so it was a hard boundary. And that's where we set up shop. I hired um, seven Indonesian field biologists, and over the course of the next several years, I added 22 rangers. Um, I speak Malay, I speak Indonesian, 
and I only spoke Indonesian when I was there. No one ever spoke English to me, and I wouldn't reply in English. Um, and these guys were um, really pretty good at what they did. And so here are the, just to show you the, the sites of where the cameras were all located. And um, we would go out and initially we tied our uh, cameras, our infrared cameras, to trees. But what we found out was that at night, elephants move from one feeding area to the next. And elephants, when they're walking down a trail and the flash goes off, it pisses them off. <laughs> elephants don't like to be flashed. It scares the bejesus out of them. And so they would, they would take our cameras and smash them. They'd pull them off, and sometimes they'd throw them 30 yards away. So we came up with this ingenious idea of uh, putting together um, essentially this, we welded together this rebarb, and then we dug a, a, a one meter hole, filled it with cement, pushed the legs down in, and then wrapped it in bob wire, and, whoops, go back. It doesn't matter. Is what happened is uh, it really worked. Uh, because the elephant really would grab things with its trunk and you wrap it in bob wire. They don't like that, so they left our things away. And this is how we, we would sleep. We would just simply, now it's real important, when you're out in a place like this, you don't sleep anywhere near <coughs> the trail. Because as remember, I told you the elephants move from feeding per place to feeding place. And if you're sleeping out on the middle of the trail, they're going to step on you. Because sometimes there's 10 or 15 of these guys all in a line. So we would just lay out a, 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 a tarpaulin, plastic for the bottom, and then a rope or a branch with a tarpaulin over the top, because it's always dripping. You know, it's drip, 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 drip. You know, they always, I always said there's, there's, there's four seasons in, 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 on the equator. Rain, rainier, more rain, and lots of rain. And then it goes back to rain. Um, when you go out on these um, three, four day trips, um, we would have to carry our own food, and what you do is you wear um, one pair of uh, field clothes, and usually for me it was a pair of socks, a pair of boots, a um, pair of shorts, no underwear because you get rash really quick out there, and a t-shirt and a hat. And in your pack you have a Ziploc bag that has the same things. So when you get at the end of the day and you're making camp for the night, you go and and wash in the little stream, and then you take your warm clothes, your clean or dry clothes out, and put them on. And you get up in the morning, and you're feeling pretty good, and you put, you take all of your dry clothes off and you put them back in the bag. And then you get to put on your wet pants and your wet socks. God, I hate wet socks in the morning. I never got over it. I hated wet socks. Um, but if I took extra dry socks, all the guys would know it and make fun of me all day long. <laughs> so that's how we did things. <clears throat> and so here we are with some photographs. And this is, um, we have some beautiful photographs. This particular female, uh, she's called uh, Chin Chin Imas. So I let the guys um, name them all. Uh, Chin Chin Imas, Chin Chin is um, rain and Mas is gold. And she has from both sides this continuous unbroken band goes right around, very distinguished. And these, these stripe patterns are like individual fingerprints. You can tell every tiger instantly once you get the, the, the eye for them. And Chin Chin Imas, um, she was like a real uh, prima donna. She w walked through the cameras constantly. I think she was really uh, <laughs> happy with herself. And the, uh, then she disappeared for three months, and we thought maybe she was, something happened, or poachers came in. And then she showed up with her three cubs. These are four-month-old cubs that she has, and here they are, uh, same cubs at uh, about nine months of age. And see, they're sniffing that camera uh, stanchion there, not playing with it. Um, this is one of the males in that same territory, and could well have been the father, but we don't know that. Uh, they called this guy, and. You can tell he's a, a much older, a very mature male, because the males uh, develop these real dark mutton chops on the sides of their face. And um, they called it, this guy, Gembong Rahwana. <laughs> and uh, Gembong Rahwana translates as big badass of the forest. <laughs> I love that, that name. 
Okay, here's a, like a real young, uh, yeah, almost immature, thin tiger, like a teenager. Another tiger, another male, another male. Uh, and one of the things, <laughs> I told the staff, don't you dare name a tiger after me. And oh. about six, seven months later, I showed up and I was looking through this thing. I said, oh, who's this thing? And he said, oh, that's Lewis. That's my middle name. <laughs> And if you look, Lewis has this scar, has another scar on the other side. It turns out Lewis just got his butt kicked everywhere he went. <laughs> he, he, he was really a wussy man. And uh, I was really embarrassed about that in a sense. But um, OK, more tigers, another different tigers. And we just have, uh, over the course of uh, 12 years, we took 14,788 photographs. Uh, and so it's, a, it's quite a, an inventory. Another day. And those were all just tigers? Um, <laughs> some of them were other animals, but a good share of them were tigers, yeah. Yeah, we were really good at photographing tigers. And so that's, it, we kind of come to a, my talk here. So why are tigers so important? Because where tigers live, biodiversity thrives. And these are the other kinds of photographs. Amazing animal. This is, this is the Sumatran rhino, 200 rhino. And this is an animal the size of a Volkswagen bus. Mm -hmm. And the Indonesian rangers did not even know they had rhinos in their park. And I couldn't figure that out. I said, Jesus Christ, how do you miss a guy this big? <laughs> uh, and it, it, it turns out, it turns out that the Indonesian, all of them, for the most part, are terrified of being in the forest and absolutely terrified of staying over in the forest. So their whole idea of going in on a survey and seeing what's going on is to walk, because we're right on the equator, they walk in from sunrise six hours exactly, and they stop and have lunch. But not a long lunch, because they've only got six hours to get out before it's dark. And if you look on the map, it's only the periphery. It's in the core area of this park where no one goes, where all of these animals were. And that's where we had our study site. So we had not only rhinos, but elephants coming down through the park, <clears throat> Malayan tapers coming down through the park, bearded pigs. And see the size of this particular pig and that particular tree? Same tree, same place, Malayan bear. Same tree, same site, uh, golden cat with a young. Uh huh. Clouded. Yep, clouded leopard. Yeah, you can actually. Okay, and on and on and on, and it was really fun doing this whole project. Um, and but I also uh, got called away uh, by China because they decided that I had a personal relationship after this uh, 1988 uh, year of the Tiger Conference. The guy <laughs> pointed out this Wei Sheng Wang. Um, he actually called me up and said, I want you to come to China to lead the survey to, to find out how many tigers are, uh, of the South China tiger, the uh, Moyensis subspecies, are left in Southern China. And so I went. <laughs> That's how I, it says, welcome Ron Tilson, hero. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here's what happened. Uh, Mao Zedong, uh, in, in the 50s, in order to uh, increase the production of steel uh, for what he thought was going to be the Industrial Revolution of China, he had all of the trees cut down in all of the national parks. And then he also had the Great Cultural Revolution where all of the intellectuals in China, doctors, dentists, lawyers, lawyers aren't intellectuals. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, of the, all of the intellectuals, they had to leave their, their, where they were working and they had to go uh, and, and live, live and make their way off the land. And many tens of thousands of Chinese died because one, they didn't have the skills. It all happened so suddenly and some of them got caught just getting up in the mountains in the middle of the winter and it's really, really cold and it's no fun and it was pretty awful. And so there were probably none in China after 1990. And this is the area. Uh, this is a 
This is an area um, about the size of Texas, the five provinces. And these are the various areas that we went to. And over the next 18 months, we went up and down these mountains. And the, we, we were about 9,000 feet, and, and, the, and the top of the mountains were right around um, somewhere between 10 and 11. So you have to walk <laughs> up about 3,000 feet to get over the hump and then 3,000 down to get to the valley where you might be staying overnight. And I always like to say this, you know, if you go to the gym, this is 12,000 steps on a Stairmaster. And that's just going up. Then you gotta go down. And you would be surprised at how much your thighs don't like that. <laughs> and here's what we found up in these really high mountains is what they did after they cut down everything, they planted it with lodgepole pine and, and fir for telephone poles. And you can see the rows and rows, it's like corn. The second part, which really amazed me, being an ecologist, is that even during the summer, we would go through these parks, you wouldn't hear a single bird. You look in the streams and you see no fish. You turn over rocks, you see no insects. You see no wildlife. There's nothing there, nothing except cows that belong to the villagers. And so after all of these surveys, I uh, wrote a, I just came to the conclusion, especially when I found out that the farmers were, who use these, uh, these big cows or cattle to uh, plow their fields, because they did it the old fashioned way, then they would take them up in the forest and release them for seven months to fatten up until plowing began next year. And not a single cow ever was reported preyed upon. And if there was a tiger up there, the cow wouldn't be up there, that we know. Number two, with another park which I found even more amusing, they were much more ingenious. They decided that they would go get goats and they bought 50 goats and they released them up on this mountain slope and other places and after a year when I came there I asked, how's everything? And they, they said that everything's doing good and I said, how many goats did you let go? And they said, 50. And they said, how many do you have now? And they said, oh, 65. Good. Yeah, and I was thinking, well, no tigers, and we never, we never saw it. Yeah, tigers leave big poops, man. You don't, you don't miss poop of a tiger. You sooner or later you're gonna find it, and they have big paw prints. And if you're humping up and down these trails day after day after day after day for 18 months, by golly, you're gonna find something. We found nothing, so I uh, decided that there were none. Published the paper, <laughs> and I was told to leave and I couldn't come back for a whole year. They were really angry with me because the Chinese do not like to lose face and they lost big face on that. And so then there's this whole thing about the South China tigers that um, actually were in the zoos and I had done some work with them uh, five, six years earlier and the whole business here, and I'm not gonna really go into it, is that they really are very poor genetically but one of the things that really gave me the depth of understanding of how much the Chinese wanted is that one day this Chinese peasant had this photograph that he appeared that he shot of a wild South China tiger up in the mountains of where a place we had been. And it had a uh, few of this and this. And I was, when that picture appeared, the very day it appeared, I was actually in the office of the, of the state forestry officers, uh, head, you know, head of uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and his assistant. They said, is this real? And I looked at it and I said, well, no, how can it? When you look at this tiger, one, he's got his tongue out. And this guy has 26 pictures of this tiger looking at him from 16 feet away. A wild tiger, no less. It's a really fat tiger. And then about two weeks later, the aha moment, the Chinese uh, have this thing about being on the internet. They found a calendar with this picture. And it's exactly the same animal. The guy made a blow up calendar, cut it out, took it up in the mountains, and uh, put it in the <laughs> took a photograph. And because there was a, a, a like a ten thousand dollar award made on, on the first tiger, and he got the award, and then they got this, and he got ten years in prison. <laughs> so can we restore, and I'm not gonna really go into this, but after they brought me back, 
they said, okay, we accept the fact that we don't have wild tigers, so what's our next step? Said, you only have one step, and that's restoration. So we spent the next six years going out and, and finding out where are the best sites where these tigers can be reintroduced, where are the sites that are big enough that are going to be approved by the cat specialist group, where are the sites where there's the least amount of people where you have defendable boundaries, where are the sites where we can actually start up prey breeding and, and bring back the prey species that we need in sufficient time uh, over a 10 year period, and where can we get, how can we release the tigers and how do you do all of that. And we actually put together the plan. Uh, it was uh, over a 10 year period, it was a $20 million plan. Um, and I think it would have succeeded if they would have started it. But they decided that they didn't want to pay for it. They wanted me or somebody else go find money. Well, I wasn't interested in that, so I'm back here at Clemson University. Um, and here is a little bit of that picture of going to these different places with the different maps. We really had a pretty good time, and we did find these two places, the Hooping Shan Huha, which is on the left side, and maybe the Mang Shan Nanling, because when we looked at the size of these areas, they're actually, if you look very carefully at that, you can just see that they were good. And then they're all a spatial analysis, and there are so, th there's some real verticality in, in these Chinese mountains that we didn't think were too good. And here's like a little teeny village, it's about two days walk in from the boundary. And they have these little teeny things perched here and there. And then there are areas like this, and this shows you, if you look all the way down that valley where that road finally comes in, that's sort of the valley and we're way, 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 way up. And I hated being on those roads because they don't have road guards. And they drive really fast. Um, and it always frightened the heck out of me. So the whole idea is this new emerging but less understood challenge about reintroducing tigers. Is, is, it, is it going to work or not? Well, human population rates we know are huge and densities are higher. Economic growth is, is also cutting into things and we have this public interest and everything else. It's a real challenge, but I think it can be overcome and that is back to this slide that I talked to you about earlier because Kazakhstan and Turkestan and Uzbekistan, where these tigers once lived, all want tigers reintroduced. And World Wildlife Fund is working with them, and they have a pretty good plan to do it. And they're going to be using the Amur tigers, and they're probably going to get the Amur tigers not from the Russian Far East, but from the European Species Survival Plan. But the North American program would be fine with sending Amur tigers from our zoos. And you don't just take zoo tigers and put them out in the wild. Th this is a 10-year process where you, you, you take males and females that are compatible, and you put them in small enclosures, and I mean, you know, a mile square, and you have small prey put in them, and they learn how to hunt and kill these small prey, and then you start putting in bigger prey, and then you take the cubs that are born in three years, and you put them in an even bigger outdoor enclosure with bigger prey that they prey on, and when they start getting settled in after uh, maybe even it's the third generation, Everyone has a lot of confidence that this could be done. Now, maybe not, but it, it beats not having anything. So that's why I've put a lot of effort into thinking about this. And so I don't even want to go into th I think I've said enough about tiger restoration. It's, it's really an imperative shift across all of Asia. Um, it's such a globally important species. There's a lot of funding I think will become available. And it's just like what you guys are up against, powerful vehicle for education and conservation ethics. And there's really strong support in China for this, and even possibly for Korea and other places. And now, this is where all of the conversion starts. I was really so surprised with you guys when, um, now, I, I put this together a week ago. And one of the things I was thinking is that, well, college, I, I have a young son and he's a little, social networker too. And um, I knew that this is the way you can bring what you do on an everyday basis into this new realm of trying to affect a change. And that is using the, 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 the internet and using all of the different ways that the internet works. And I only uh, bring this up uh, simply because uh, this is something that I helped start at the Minnesota Zoo for the zoo. Uh, so what we're trying to do is duplicate a model developed by Sarah Christie in Europe with the European zoos. 
because what was going on is you get these European zoos, North American zoos, and they all want to do a little bit for conservation. So they want to send you know, hundred dollars here, five hundred here, ten thousand here, fifteen thousand here, ten dollars here, and they don't know where to send the money and they don't know how to follow it up. So she came up with the idea: let's get a group of people together and and call it. Uh, she called it 21st century. The zoos all send the money to ZSL, the Lunch Society, and they have separate account where that all goes. And then she meets with representatives from all of the zoos that contribute to this fund on a yearly basis at the annual meetings. And then they all decide on the projects that they want to fund. And it's pretty close to what we're trying to do now in North American zoos. And it's pretty close to, I think, the thinking that you guys have. And it's not necessarily just funding, because there's this whole thing with this uh, tiger conservation campaign. How many times did somebody say raising awareness? Awareness, how, much, how many times did aware? It was, it was all over the place. You guys are doing exactly that everything. Uh, tiger photo sharing, you can, you can get into that. Uh, when you go on your, your little trips to India, and you can, you can post those photos and get a lot of people really excited. And then you have these overviews and it's, it, I just thought, whoa! And I was going to delete these slides because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to let you think that I was more clever than I am, uh, but I decided I'd rather be more clever. Uh, <laughs> just <for that> <laughs> uh, and remember, I told you all, Global Cons uh, Tiger Conservation Day is July 29th. I don't even know who uh, coined this. I think probably World Wildlife Fund. And I understand it's in the <coughs> summer, and you're all off doing your own thing, so you might want to change that. But it's a good idea. And Finally, is what I would like to just say it's, it's your turn. Don't fail. No pressure. No pressure. Because then I'll have to use the F word. <laughs> and I have to say, I really enjoyed being here. I, I know that uh, my other colleagues, that, or the mentors, the speakers, were and really so happy to see you again here. Your, your enthusiasm and love and kindness is, just shines. And same with you, Carol. Uh, we have really passionate dedicated people here. And uh, I congratulate each and every one of them for your insights. And particularly, I think David really deserves a shout out for really being the behind the scenes architect. <laughs> Somebody else had this photo. And I don't know who showed it, but I don't want you to get it wrong. But whoever had it got it wrong. This tiger, yes, was a bad boy. He was eating people's dogs and cattle around this village, but he was, he was caught in a snare. He was snared with a soft caught snare, but it, it really did rub his paw on. So they, they brought in uh, the, uh, 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 the team from uh, the Siberian Tiger Project, and they immobilized this guy. And then they took him to kind of a makeshift clinic and cleaned up his wound and sutured some of it and uh, put him on antibiotics for uh, uh, no more than two days and then um, brought him back to this area and released him. And, and when I saw this photo, they sent it to me before it was even published, uh, the, the thought that came to my mind, freedom, freedom at last. And it just is powerful. And so I wanted to say thank you for having me and putting up with me. It was really a pleasure. We have a, oh, you have a question. Okay. Which species you enjoy the most? I know you conserve all the areas in Indonesia. Where which was the biggest challenge for you? Well, the biggest challenge definitely was was China. <laughs> And I didn't particularly like it. Uh, I just felt like obligated to do it. Uh, I, I really truly enjoyed Indonesia. It was, it was sort of like, it was the payoff for all of my life of being involved with all of these other things that finally let me do what I really wanted to do in a way that I thought was noble and wonderful and exciting. Um, and we, we had a huge holistic program with anti-poaching and public awareness and all sorts of things. And, I just felt like I was uh, in heaven when I was there. So you think the anti-poaching methods 
conditions are steps you took the decrease in the incidents? Yes and no. Um, we, could, we shut down poaching, absolutely. They never, no, after a word got around, what happened to you if you got caught in our parks, they never came back again. So that was the answer. But it was expensive. And as I told you, after 12 years is what happened is um, ExxonMobil made a decision that they wanted to um, cut off long-term grantees and give opportunities for young grantees to get money to start up new projects. And so I was left with, uh, it's really, <laughs> I couldn't raise the money without ExxonMobil. So uh, the teams left. Um, I had, you know, released them. Uh, so some of my uh, basic uh, field managers stayed on with the project and eventually started their own NGO in terms of monitoring. But um, uh, the poachers came back. Uh, the military police came back, shooting the hell out of everything. Um, and there's a lot of really ugly pictures that I could have shown you of what they've done. And no prosecution. Uh, so it worked for a while, but it wasn't sustainable unless there was money. And then you go to Russia, and it's a whole different story, because in Russia you have this really horrible cold area where you have, instead of a tiger with a one or two uh, uh, hundred square kilometer range, you have a, a, a male tiger will have a 400 square home range, miles home range. And, and just recently, with uh, one of the things that's gone on in Russia, is the uh, Russian military released uh, over uh, 2,000 or 3,000 of the troops that come out of Vladivostok to trim down their army. And when they dismiss these guys from the army, they get to take home their rifles. And these are real poor peasant guys. Um, they don't have any education. They don't have any life to go back to, so they go back to where their mother and fathers are, who are living around on the edges of the national parks. And there's only one way these guys can make a living, and that's to go into the park and shoot the deer and use the deer to pay or to, for, for selling on the black market to help their mother and father and themselves. Um, and that, of course, de depletes the prey base. So uh, everywhere I went and everywhere I've looked, and believe me, the other places like Cambodia, there are no tigers left in Cambodia. There's no tigers left in Vietnam, regardless of what anyone says, World Wildlife Fund. They just don't want to admit it. Um, and there are uh, eventually uh, very, very few tigers. It, it, well, there are no tigers in, in China except for occasional transient. Um, and as you go down through um, uh, Thailand, they talk about the empty forest syndrome. It's, it's already happened. Same thing has happened in Myanmar, empty forest. There's nothing there. And uh, Malaysia is on the verge of falling because uh, the Thai poachers, who were really good, have come down the peninsula and are now working in, in northern uh, Malaysia, and they'll soon be working in, in the rest of, uh, and they'll clean out the peninsula. And, and, and Sumatra isn't much better. They talk about three, four hundred tigers, but we know that there's much less than that. So it's a really pretty miserable and very bleak uh, look into the future. And so something has to be done. Um, so say I, once, when, I, when, I, when I retired, uh, one of the interviewers said, well, tell me about your, your, your great successes. And I told him about my Adopt-a-Park program, I was real happy with that. And Tiger SSP program, I was real happy about that because I got rid of white tigers from the SSP population. I said, geez, I can't think of anything else. And they said, well, how about your study in, in, in uh, Sumatra? And I said, that wasn't a success. I failed. Failed in China, too. I'm big enough to admit it, but it's true. Well, you have a different, you're such an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> so how, if the governments won't enforce the law, they don't protect the farms, and ultimately, they're the only people who can save these mountains, right? Yeah. If, if India wants tigers, it's up to the Indian government yeah. to protect the parks. Americans. Yeah, the, Indi the Indians will take care of themselves. They're, they're very laborious and slow and convoluted and complicated, but they will take care of their troubles. And in every tiger range country, it's the same. Ultimately, there's really very little we can do. We can throw money at it, but then 
that's how I feel. The, 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 the other Asian countries just do not have the same relationship and the, and the same uh, a cultural uh, uh, feeling about wildlife uh, as, as the Indian uh, general public does. And, and I personally feel, because everyone, uh, I, I don't think tigers are ever going to disappear because there's going to come a point in time, it's, it's like a watershed. It, it is going to get so critical, somebody somewhere is going to step in and say, this cannot happen. But we also have, and don't forget, and I don't know, one of you guys brought it up, the climate change stuff. Um, this is really going to dramatically impact those forests. Uh, especially uh, in the more northern areas. So they're really going to dry out and it's going to really change. But no one knows in what direction and in what time frame. So I'm just looking at the, the more proximal factors. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a very pessimistic short term, but I, I think there's, there's a glimmer of hope that things are going to, to come around. I have one last question. Um, some people have said that the, the largest U.S. export is actually our culture that young people around the world want to be like American youth. They, they, their music, their clothes, everything they do is modeled after us. Well, not exactly. Not quite. Korea has a Gangnam style. <laughs> <laughs> but um, is there something young people, you know, so the, maybe the U.S. government could apply pressure and say, Indonesia, you got to get serious about this, or to Thailand or something. I mean, at that level, perhaps they're I, 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 I absolutely agree. For example, we, we give Indonesia and a lot of the other Asian countries billions of dollars of aid. Aid for, for lots of different reasons, including military. And they can just say, we find this unacceptable that you're, you're just completely wiping out your forest, uh, uh, your biodiversity. Well, and this is the point I, I failed to make. Why are tigers so important? I didn't make the connection between, uh, uh, like in Sumatra, where, where you have all of these hundreds of different kinds of different species living in these parks under the umbrella or uh, of, of the tiger. And you go to China where all of the tigers were massacred and there's nothing there. There's nothing. There's not a single bug. There's not a single bird. That's how bad it is. When you lose the tiger, all of the other elements move in. The tiger keeps everyone out. The tiger is the icon. It's the symbol of wilderness. And when you lose the tiger, you lose everything. So don't fail. <laughs> oh, over here? Uh, since we aren't over there in the country where these tigers are, and since we can't force like, what's already stated, you know, people who do guard these parks to do a better job, what do you think is the best course of action for us? Well, all you need to do is get rich, marry a really rich guy, and become a philanthropist, <laughs> or figure out a way to get your own money. Or what I did is I just decided that I was going to make it my life, and I was going to get involved. And when I first saw tigers or been involved, I decided there is nothing on earth that's going to stop me from being a champion of this wonderful animal. And so I was about your age when I made that decision. So you're just ripe. Back there, Sean. I just had a question regarding uh, the introduction of tigers into the Middle East. Yes. Are they considering to do that? And have they tried out the methodology elsewhere? Because I know you're talking about the expansion of the country. They want to do it. They have, a, they have a sort of a plan. And no, they haven't tried it. There has been no real reintroduction. Um, but there has been, and we've done this too, translocations. Translocations do work sometimes, not all the times. Sometimes the tigers come back or they're shot and killed because they can't settle in. But other tigers do manage to, to stay on. And, and so that may be a, a way, but I think the, for the most part, no one's going to be willing to do that. Russia is not going to give up any of its few hundred wild tigers to send to Kazakhstan, where the Chechens live. Political statement. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go drink whiskey. Yeah. <laughs>